start out with something that I have a physical name I have not with the This is my style. Why would I show this to you? <clears throat> my involvement with muskrats, I, a long time ago in my career, I realized that probably I became a weapon scientist because I grew up as a muskrat trapper. And I have a great appreciation for these animals because they helped pay for me going through college. But um, this slideshow that you saw, um, it's very misleading. It contains a lot of misinformation. Um, I'll get back to muskrats in a minute. The main reason I showed it is the problem with, with all the public meetings that, that, are, that take place on the, on the IJC study is the public never got an education about what lake levels were all about, how the Great Lakes operate. And in my half hour that I have here, I'm going to try and give you a quick snapshot of education on I have the advantage in that in my career I've worked all the way from the west end of Lake um, Superior all the way down to down the river from here one of the ways and wetlands all across the whole system. And I have a better understanding of it than probably most anyone um, who's ever lived because no one else had the same mission as I had. One thing that I realized <clears throat> every place I, I did any wetland research was the importance of, of water level fluctuations. These are hydrographs. They're on um, um, graphs of the water levels, the measured water levels from 1860 to the present for all the lake systems. There's some similarity among all of them. Um, lake Michigan Huron goes up and down quite a lot. Lake Erie does the same thing, although it's not quite as much. Lake Superior used to do it until the early, early uh, 1900s when Lake Superior. 
curve and brought the bore and begin regulating water levels on it. And you see the far end of this, um, there's not too much change. Lake Ontario did the normal thing until about 1960 when it became a reservoir and they began regulating water levels. I'm going to go to Lake Michigan Huron because it shows the most uh, change and point out a few of the high and low lake levels and I'll refer to them in some of the slides that I'll be showing you. So first let's look at the 1986 high. People said this is the highest the lake had ever been. So, Look back here, it was higher than that. Before that, it was even higher than, than, than that period. People just haven't lived long enough to know how high it was. Right after the 86 high water levels, within two years, dropped three quarters of a meter. It was a high, it was a moderate high in 1997. Two years later, water levels dropped by another quarter of a meter, or three quarters of a meter, and they've been largely below ever since. So it was a low period in the 90s. Starting in the 90s, a high, a low period in the mid 1960s, a high here, low during the dust bowl days in the 1930s, and this 90s, 30s, 60s, 30s. I will contend there's another low right here, and another low right there. And I'll explain to you, to you in a minute why I consider them as low. So, but from a weapon standpoint, what do the high and lows mean? This horizontal line A is the highest high lake level that, that occurs. Anywhere above that is probably going to be upland. The horizontal line C is the lowest low lake level that occurs. Anything below that never gets to be water. It always has to be any water on it. It's dominated by submerged and floating vegetation. And the zone in between there, the broad expanse of the shoreline, sometimes has standing water, sometimes has no water on it. To the action zone for all the weapon diversity is taking place. <coughs> what makes it happen? The top slide here, during a high lake level period, the top graph on uh, the canopy dominating emergent species, things like cattail or dry mites, have water that's too high and they're killed. The invading shrubs and trees, often shrubs and trees, can't handle the water and they're killed. Water levels start to come down and expose the seed thing. These are the seeds of all the other plants that have been growing there and depositing their seeds through time, just waiting to be exposed to the air so they can turn to grow. Water levels go down even lower and more expands the shoreline is exposed and, and more diversity of vegetation um, takes, play, takes place. Those big guys, the cattail, the dragon mites, and the baby shrubs come back again too. But if you circle or cycle around to the high lake level and you're killed, send those over and over and over. And it's really, really critical. You have to have highs, you have to have lows, and you have to have repeated highs and repeated lows. I'm going to show you a few pictures here. A study that I did on uh, Lake Huron, the Lake Huron level following the high in 1986. By 1988, water levels had dropped in three quarters of a meter. In 1988, the shoreline was probably about here. 1987, the shoreline about there. And now, there's no standing water here, so water levels really drop. Take a look at the trees there, and we show the same scene one year later. Total revegetation area, most cost to the taxpayers, zero. Mother Nature doing its thing. A little bit different angle on it, but here's about one year later. Okay. This isn't the only high in, in the high low lake level period, nor the only site that has, has happened. I have another sequence of slides from some place I happen to visit just about every year in the pictures. And I have a nice smokestack up there so that uh, you can figure out where you are. So this is a drowned river mouth that flows into Lake Michigan. And so the stream that comes down here goes under the bridge over there. Water levels here go up and down with lake level. This was in 1999 when water levels had dropped like three quarters of a meter from the 1997 high. And there's no vegetation here. The high water level would wipe them out. But the same scene a year later. 
These are all mud flat annuals. They're annuals, plants that grow in the They have a whole lot, a lot of seeds that grow through the night. Same seed a year later, now dominated by perennial plant species. A couple of years later, perennials, because they've gotten a lot bigger. You need to see different ones. Another year later, lo and behold, this is that meadow marsh community, the sedgegrass meadow we've been talking about, that we talked about earlier, starting to come in here and show off. And I was there this past summer. This is a solid meadow marsh. This is what we're looking for, folks. This is what doesn't happen in Lake Ontario anymore. Why is it there? Because we had an extended low lake the whole period and we this year. So I contended that there are lows occurring roughly every 30 years. Why do I think that? Part of our global climate change study that we did a long time ago, um, we looked at sequences of beach ridges uh, in, in a series of veins on the Michigan and Huron that were actually superior to. A long time ago, three or 4,000 years ago, there's Lake Michigan out there. The lake came way back in here, a big, large endangered. During the, light, the last stages of the high lake level phase, formed a beach ridge. Lake level went down, came back up again, and formed a new beach ridge. The lake where the old just happened over and over and over and over again, forming all these beach ridges. One of my colleagues, who's a coastal sedimentologist and also big and strong, got <laughs> right here uh, using a vibro cord to take on sand cores, we found in every one of those beach ridges you saw here and a whole lot of other sites. And they're every full linear foot weighs 10 pounds, so that's why that's why you walk this way. But he can take the cores, split them open, and there are geologic, geologic information in there that tells you the elevation of the lake each bit when each one of those beach ridges was born. Getting some radio carbon dates from the wetlands in between, you can put together a long term lake level curve. This is 4,700 year record lake levels. Not a little itty bitty thing like we have in the, the human measured um, lake levels. The lakes have been here in geologic time. This is what they've been doing. There's some outlet changes here, but over the last 3,000 years, roughly every 160 years, High, followed by a low and another high. Um, the highs are not always the same. It's not exactly 160 years, but there's a periodicity here being driven by climate. During warm, lake, uh, warm climatic periods, there's not as much ice on the, on the lakes, and you get more evaporation during the winter, and the water levels go down. During cool climatic periods, the opposite happens. There's more ice, the water levels stay higher. You look at this, this would be a really messy curve if it showed everything in it. So here's just an inset from a little up here, from a, a small portion of it. Each one of these humps is made up of five little humps. Each one of those five humps is the 30, 33 year uh, uh, beach ridge formation that I showed in the other diagram. So here we go 30 year low, 30 year low, 30 year low. 30 year low, partly up on the slope of one of those long term highs, and another 30 year low at the top of one of those long, long term highs. Lake Ontario, well, you're all interested. It did the same thing. Here's the low, the low, the low, almost the low in 1960, because there wasn't a lot of water in 1964. Water levels were regulated. This probably should have been down in here somewhere. The 1986 high that occurred on all the other lakes is right there. Lake Ontario didn't happen. The lows that started in 1999, about here, basically never happened in Lake Ontario. Five to 1058 feet of deviations is designed not to let them happen. Instead, during this post around regulation period, lows never occur. The highs are, are topped off and generally not um, extremely high, doing what the regulation plan is supposed to do. They never let them get lows occur. We took the current regulation plan and ran it over the 
next hundred years, here, 2000 up to 2100, this is what it would look like. And everything that I should told you and showed you about how weapons required the highs and lows, this is the absolute worst thing that could ever happen to a weapon on a great way. This is what the true plan was. This is what we're trying to get over. Lake Ontario has a whole lot of really neat weapons. The entire east shore of the lake is weapon. And unfortunately, unfortunately there's a lot of cash in there. There's still a lot of neat areas in it. I got involved in the Lake Ontario lake level studies back in the early 90s with the IPC water level drug regulation study. We had one year to go collect uh, a bunch of data. We did a lot of sampling on uh, sample of 18 weapons in Lake Ontario and 17 in Lake Superior, both of which are regulated. Lake Superior, where they don't really knock the socks out of the regulation or out of the water level fluctuations. There's a gradient of vegetation change from deeper water to shallower water and up onto the more soil. Lake Ontario basically has a submerged community, a wall, and we have that. And I had the opportunity a number of times to speak in front of, in front of IJC commissioners, and I would always show them the slide and say, you're responsible. <laughs> so eventually, and I'm not claiming uh, credit for this, but eventually the funding was available uh, for the new study. I had been designing how to do this you know, full-blown study for 10 years. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And there are two phases of it. So we uh, started out, we, we identified 32 wetlands on the US Canadian side that had minimal uh, impact on other things like agriculture or uh, industrial uh, outflows to look at. Uh, there are four different geomorphic types that are under <coughs> each wetlands, ground, river mouth, open damage, protected things. The first phase of it was to, to shoot new color infrared in a photo. <coughs> color infrared is simply taking things that look green in nature and making them various shades of red. It's easier to distinguish uh, differences in, in color. And do photo interpretation and identify the things that are different vegetation, identifiable vegetation types. And you go out in the field and see what it is. So we did this. This is Stony Creek. <coughs> And here's some Stone Creek data. So, the Meadow Mars, the Cetrapsy Meadow, pre regulation in 1959. Um, and the water levels were still low in the mid, in the mid 60s, so we're still Meadow Mars there. And it basically disappeared. There, there was very little capital to begin with. Now, everything that used to be Meadow Mars is capital. Frank showed this one earlier, so this is the field day on the walls of the island. And he showed the sequence of them from uh, the metal marsh disappearing, and tail taking over. Go a little further down the river, this is Goose Bay, the east end of Goose Bay. And the same thing happened. Leave here for a second to look at, but um, it's pretty obvious that the capital will take over following um, regulations. I have always thought that it was the lack of cattail invasion was due to the lack of high lake levels. The high lake levels required to flood them out. So if I found out that does happen to some extent, the majority of cattail invasion from our um, air photo data, I learned that the majority of invasion was land work. And the reason is that the high lake level or the the high lake levels driven by the regulation plan keep the soils in the upper ends of the wetlands wet. How many of you have lawns? And how many of you have lawns that turn really brown when, it, when it, you go for a drop? How many of those, how much, how much your grass dies? When it rains, it greens up again. The sedges and grasses are adapt, adapted for doing that. Okay? They, it gives them a competitive advantage. The cattails, big tall plants with big fleshy root rhizomes or roots, cannot handle the dry periods. 
So you keep the lake level high all the time. The captain will say, it's wet enough for me. I'm this tall, you're this tall, thank you, I took over. And that's what they did. And this graph demonstrates that. And, uh, the invasion of Patna will be upland for the Netherlands. We're still uh, Catville moving down to the water's edge, where the water waters can be for capitals are all the units just drops off. This little wall, Catville wall, the northern pipe we were talking about this morning, wanted to get out to the small end with a little bit of, of second out of it's up here, it's still left. They keep running into that wall. The Saginato, this, this is a pretty big Saginato for most of what's not, most of the wildlands in Lake Ontario, but it's squeezed in between the invading Pat Hill and the Alpine. The exception is Kent's Creek, which flows into Mud Bay down here. This is a little southwest of Cape Vincent, and it's big, flat, and flat, broad basin. The dark area is the main Cat Hill, but the lighter green is um, is said grass meadow. There's enough area that's high enough and dry enough for the sedges to survive, and the cattails, it's, it's a little too dry for them. On the other hand, you can almost see the cattails in the day. You're watching them march here from year to year as they move up slow. The other thing that IJC wanted to study is predictive capability to know. Generate a new regulation plan. How much wetland is going to be? How much metal marsh is there being when you did that? And this is one that I had designed for a long time. To do that was sample, sample vegetation along elevation trans, transects to follow elevation contours. So you lay out the line, the sample vegetation, everywhere you sample is at the same elevation, the same height above the lake level. To do that, you have to take the one nature gauge. So this top line is 75.6 meters. Anything you sample along there had last been flooded 30 years ago. Anything that last been uh, was on the 75.45 had last been flooded 10 years ago. We're figuring out the type of plant communities to grow when it had been flooded or dewatered for a certain amount of time. In the low end, had uh, elevation that had last in deep water. The last time there was no standing water there during the growing season in the summer. So we had uh, seven different transects. We did the monitoring of vegetation. These guys are working at it. And I only show this for this number right here. We collected one of the popular and it was mounted by the data. 4,000 meter square quadrats for sample. So we have a lot of data that these are inclusions. Well, we other, what we also needed for studies to show if, we, if the transects define what vegetation grows at what water depth, we need to know how deep the water is when the lake is, is at any point. So we got topographic data from all of our wetlands and built models in the GIS system. Um, for each of them. So this is the open abatement, the John River Mouth, the Pirate Beach, the protected abatement. Each line on here represents an elevation contour. So in, in, within the computer system, if the lake level was right here, you know the percentage of the wetland that had water depth at any, any element. We watered up this much, we watered up this much, you know the percentage of the wetland. Put all this stuff together in a lot of computer imaginations and <clears throat> even come up with a uh, predictive capability. So, in this, we take a new, re a new re proposed regulation plan like this one. It starts in the last year, figures out uh, at what elevation has it never been flooded. And if it's never been flooded, it's assigned to you, which is up here. If it had been flooded sometime in the rain, 30 to, last been flooded 30 to 5 or 30 years ago, it was in the vegetation pipe we found in transects A, B, and C, which was never marked. Down here, where it basically hadn't been dewatered a long time, was floating in some species. The 
the Alpha's cattail and the bee is, is meadow marsh with cattails and bee. And we can figure out for every year in the sequence um, the amount of wetland that we find in the meadow marsh. We did this for all the things that were proposed. Here's the plan 58 mean deviations. If it was on a news program in one year, and a little bit of woes in the 60s and 30s. Plan 2007 with the shell, which looks an awful lot like 58 degree deviations, uh, didn't do a whole lot better. 50, or this plan B plus, the forefather of BB7, substantial lows, <coughs> there substantial lows in here, and at least starting on the lows in 1999. So this is what we're looking at. The results from the modeling, looking at the years when there was water levels, water supplies were low enough <clears throat> so that there was at least a chance for low weight levels in the regulation plan. This is the amount of metal marks, the percent of the wetlands in the Ontario that would have the percent of of the wetlands that was in the area. Pre-regulation, no regulation at all. The numbers are pretty high. And 58 easy deviations are really, really low as expected. And these guys, these other plans are somewhere in the middle. P plus isn't as good as, as pre-regulation, but it's getting there. And with realization that with the other interests involved, you can't get everything you want. But this is one heck of a lot better than that is. Just so you know, the Ontario is not unique. <clears throat> this is a site, a study site, a friend of mine did a work on Wisconsin. There are two lakes here, one with the stabilized uh, water levels, one with fluctuating water levels. Here's the one with stable water levels and <clears throat> regulated. The white lines are where the cattail was in the beginning of the study, and each of the other lines, the progression through 37 years of how cattail expanded, pretty much take over the whole thing. Here's the site where there were uh, fluctuating water levels. It grew a little bit, but it didn't take over the whole thing. If you're familiar with Sebago Lake in Maine, I did some. Um, I gave them some help on something a few years, a couple years ago. It's regulated. There's a lot of arguments going on for fee regular or for relicensing going on. And they, about 12, 15 years ago, they, they changed the regulation. And so it stayed high all summer long, every single summer. That's all captive. Gee, we have high water levels all the time here at the beach. It used to go across here, it's now way in here. It's being eroded away. Because every storm hits the, same, hits the beach at the same elevation and it erodes it. This is uh, Double Marsh in uh, Lake Manitoba uh, in Canada. It's regulated. Uh, this is all basically all cattail, too. Right now it's all flooded because it's regulated to keep Lake Little High in the head a whole series of really big storms, they couldn't handle it. Now the entire thing is flooded, it's flooded out. Nearby, on Lake Winnipeg, this wetland, this is the Red River going into Lake Winnipeg, that's all a cattail. It's regulated by hydropower at the outlet. And then you never let the water almost go low. Oh, getting back to muskrats. <laughs> which I promised to do. Um, why are they so important? What do they eat? What's their favorite food? Cattails. <laughs> okay, they eat the roots and the soft and more parts of the plant. They pile up the big parts and make platforms and houses. In doing that, they create a lot of openings in, in the habitat, which create edge habitat and openings for habitat for other species. Muskrats are considered a keystone species. You don't understand these stones. Think of the Pennsylvania license plate and everything that goes on it. Here's an arch. That's a keystone. If you didn't have the keystone in here, the arch is going to fall down. If you don't have muskrats in your wetland, the functions of the wetland fall down. Muskrats, despite what they say, are really important. <laughs> So 
as they're eating, they pile up vegetation. They, they can't eat while they're swimming, so they have to pile up vegetation. They sit up and they eat. Piles get real big, and then they make hot homes off them. They grow into the, into the, uh, the pile from below the water line, from below the um, maximum depth of the ice, so that when the ice forms, they can get out of their little house and get it out of the underwater and swim around and get food. Well, what happens on Lake Ontario? They build the house and then ice forms and 58 DD says we need to create storage capacity. So let's get rid of all the water in the year over the winter time and be ready for spring snow melt and muskrats are left high and dry. That's why you don't find any muskrats in Lake Ontario. Oh, but this is one of my sites. Um, I noticed a mask over here. This is a mask of marsh. Um, where I've worked for over 20 years. You know, in Western Lake Erie, all those little white pots are muskrat houses. That's how many muskrat houses there should be in the left. And around each one of them, there's a little circle. That's where there's no vegetation because they have to cut the cattails both for food and to create their houses. I have a grad student working in Lake Ontario and trying to figure out how many muskrats there should be versus how many there are. And about a month ago, I got them up in a small plane, fly over to see how many houses you could find, but I couldn't see any. Um, here's a couple shots in the air. I don't see any muskrat houses there. Here's another slide. This is the um, South Paulo Pond. That is a shrub, a little high style of shrub. So is that one, that one, those. Possibility that might actually be muskrat house. If we had enough ice, if it got cold enough, we used to get out here and, and, and GPS in the points where all, all those are. But we need that a little bit more cold weather. So if you don't have any lake level fluctuations, on you know, have your, your muskrat, if you don't have you get during the month, and during the month, very many muskrats. You not only have a lot of more cat help because of the lack of fluctuations, you also have less habitat for fish and wildlife. The, um, you have less meadow marsh, which is the preferred spawning habitat for northern life, um, and less re reduced access to whatever spirits and cat hills are in the way. So let's get into the shoreline issue, because they're the ones that are battling the feet of the they're not in favor of 58 deviations. They don't like it, but they don't like even seven either. Um, this is what their their shoreline looks like. This is a house. These are houses built on a barrier beach, an ephemeral barrier beach, places where nobody should ever build a house to begin with, and the, the expectation that the governments of U.S. and Canada fund them to, and, and do whatever they need to do to Lake Ontario to protect them property in the lake. And we build these, this is close to $100,000 structure on the shore. How much beach do they have there? <laughs> no. Waves come in, crash and scour it out and send them all the sand offshore. Thankfully, I'm not a physicist, but um, if you were, and look at the wave physics, here's that reduction in wave physics meaning that the sand goes way, way off there. Okay, but it's not exposing or anything more, particularly if the lake levels are always high. I have some experience with this. A um, long time ago in my career, I had an office right on the shore of Lake, of lake Michigan, south end of Lake Michigan. And um, in 1986, the really high lake levels, here's a storm. And you hear smashing in the river and forced the houses here to be uh, abandoned, including my office. Um, go back to the same slide, here's that wall, here's those steps. This is two years after the water levels went, uh, went down in 1999. Here's up, up now about 100 meters, 100 yards of, of sand and beach in front of there. <coughs> Your gut when it's here is now covered up with sand. There's a dune forming here. The next time there's a high lake up on Lake Michigan, which there will be, Here's the protection for the houses. Well, the people that are opposing 
in the South <coughs> don't understand is it is the only plan that works for them. It's the only plan that will ever get them a low lake level that will ever expose the sand and allow this to happen. Why don't we know this? Because the firm that did the, the erosion studies does erosion studies. And they, to my point of question, I said, why don't we want to build this in? You're rebuilding the shoreline during low lake level periods. They said, we don't know how. And it never got included. The problem, again, is one vegetation and that the people hopefully do have a little more education now, but the ones that are opposing DD7 don't understand that nature had to figure it out the right way to begin with. You just need to learn what nature had in, had in mind to figure out what's really good for you and not really Thank you. The 
if you're referring okay. to taking the ag lands and putting the pipe around that, to be able to restore water levels on, on what's currently ag land, that's probably in that kind of thing. Oh, the, the, what I, on that, Kenny, what I was wondering about was, um, it seems like a lot of times in those wetlands, muskrats are considered pests because they compromise the integrity of the ferns. So I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for that problem. <laughs> Um, increase the the, uh, the value of muskrat fur. I don't think you're ever solved. We have a, a similar circumstance where we've uh, impounded water uh, to give depth for the muskrat, and the muskrats will literally eat themselves on our snow. It takes a while, but it is truly impressive. They will do the solid standard cattails. And then they limit themselves. You don't see the number of houses. That's, that's right. They also, when populations get high, tularemia or liver disease kicks in and starts wiping them out. How many muskrats live in that house? Um, probably about 200. Okay. Um, Thank you. 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 Thank
system and lake system at deeper levels, <coughs> which greatly limits their uh, uh, the survival of the young who are now affected by a whole range of uh, impediments to successful spawning, everything from change in water temperature, colder temperatures, later spawning, at a time when they're more vulnerable to predation. And he has uh, pretty well charted uh, the demise of, uh, uh, of, must, uh, of uh, northern pike populations due to the very thing we're talking about today. And he has uh, some wonderful documentation of that. Uh, sometime uh, we ought to uh, get the extra look over his stuff. Yeah, and I, and I believe that. I mean, again, I'm playing you know, that kind of thing. You know, John Republic who doesn't buy this and wants to say, okay, well, show me, you know. Show me how this is really affecting the economy and fishing. See, that, Otherwise, you know, I'm worried. I'm, I want my lake property to be just as it is. Yeah. That's the next piece okay. of your. That's the next piece of. I'm going to get to that. Okay. Sorry. So, so what what does this mean in terms of economic impact, economic value? And uh, there has been the nightmare for environmentalists and ecologists uh, forever is to uh, uh, put price tags on something uh, of uh, a natural process and uh, natural production that uh, is difficult to do. And as a result, that has not been done well. So unfortunately, uh, not only is it difficult to put dollars on uh, the effect of fewer northern pike, uh, and what does that mean dollar-wise uh, compared to other, um, uh, other measures of, uh, uh, of benefit. Uh, and I think for two reasons, the difficulty in doing that, and the second, uh, there probably hasn't been uh, in the uh, biological side enough money and, and effort put into documenting uh, some of the values of uh, our natural resource benefits. Uh, so they're kind of been lost in the system, which I think brings us back to uh, here we are now, uh, just beginning to assess uh, uh, some of the uh, ecological relationships that play in here. And maybe one of these days we can get to answering that question and put dollar signs on it. But I'm not so sure it's a quantifiable resource, and that's a problem. The other side of that argument is from the landowner, property owners. A couple of years ago, Peter Annan, who wrote the book, Great Water Wars, did a tour with, with, with environmental journalists around the lake. And a picture of that I showed in front of with the shoreline and development. We were at that guy's house, and these journalists around there. And I was sitting here, and the owner of the property was sitting here, and the journalist right here asked the question, so I was turned this way, and he didn't see me. The journalist said, how can you people on this small stretch of shoreline who built houses on Barrier Beach expect that you can take over into the entire lake and control the lake, um, where it doesn't affect anybody anywhere else, but it's affecting you because you built your, your house where you shouldn't build it? I got this big grin on my face. If I could have landed in Washington, that was the question that she asked. He didn't see me grinning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put a piece on the economic um, argument there. Is, um, the Brookings, Inst Brookings Institution did a study uh, three years ago, two years ago, um, and looked at the economic benefit of ecological restoration in the Great Lakes region. So they were trying to sort of justify investing dollars in restoration projects. Um, and they found a two to one return. So every dollar invested in restoration, we were getting two dollars in return from sort of the economic benefits of that healthier ecosystem. And here we are, so we have a, a plan that we built towards BB7. Although it won't restore everything, it'll help us move further in that direction. So without really spending any money, you know, because we know we're never going to have enough money to restore acre by acre. So that overall benefit. I guess my point for asking all this was just to yeah. get that no. point out. We're, we're trying to sell the proposal. Is. And bring it in the end, tying yeah. all that down to. And I understand the metrics of you know the economic things. Tony, I know you're. Yeah, I just I, I just have to weigh in a little bit because I think that often these um, discussions we think come down to economics. Um, uh, I think there are other ways to make the case um, by by art strings, and I think in in some respects that's the better way to go when you're talking about the situation. Just let me give you a little example. Uh, we have this little industrial activity happening in Northern Alberta called the oil sands. Okay, so, okay, we were just trying to use an economic instrument to make the case to protect fish or the river or wetlands in that system. Uh, and we're involved there. We're not using that tag. We would be in big trouble because people would simply shrug it off and say, you know, 
know what, no matter how deep you dig, and speculating here, how deep you dig into the ecosystem and do valuation, those barrels of oil and opening up markets in the US and China um, are going to outweigh that uh, quite easily, unless you go over a long term and then you're in a, in a big economic discussion. So I, I think it's, I always look at it as a tool. Pull out of the bag when you uh, might need a tool to make a case, but, but caution about handing too much on it because those situations are just um, the value of oil right now, obviously, the clips of that If you're not familiar with parts, maybe I have friends who are doing wetlands studies out there. It is an environmental disaster like a mountaintop mining, coal mining. It is horrendous. Coal destruction. I mean, the economic argument, I think, is just probably not particularly helpful given our inability to understand how the ecosystem really works. And then you try to make these short term comparisons with property prices. I would suggest that if you look at the theme of flood regulation, which basically encourages people to build up alongside the shore at huge public expense. If you do away with that subsidy, it can change the entire dynamics of who wants to live in the water park. And it's that subsidy of FEMA, which is in the billions of dollars now, taken away, and people will not be on the top of the water park the way they are now. Now, I'd quite prefer to make that better argument than ecosystem versus. Got it. <laughs> and I'm a little bit, I'm really uneducated on factions and things, so maybe someone can tell me. Who, what, what do you, who are the main people who oppose this plan? Do you think that homeowners on the waterfront? Or me not owners on the waterfront? I mean, <coughs> from, personal, who are from personal experience, it's people that live on Edgewater Drive in Greece, New York. <laughs> <laughs> Place that will allow occasional periodic low lake levels 
it's not going to get rid of all the cattails that are there now. And you need to have some type of human intervention. Unfortunately, you know, the study I had, I uh, showed you a picture on Kemp's Creek, the closing mud bay. I've got two grad students working there on, on methods to take back the such grass meadow from the cattail. I couldn't find anyone to fund it because the, the, the larger current applications of it said, well, you're, you're just going to restore an area of this bit size of this room, which is the study the size and study side instead of the whole thing. They want to know numbers of acres. You know, how many hundreds of acres we could restore. If we could get the methods down right, we could restore, we have the, the find the means to be used to restore portions of every bottom of that material. But right now it has to be funded. We're just doing that because we want to. <laughs> what you're saying, we need more mother nature's help. We, a, to absolutely. Unless, unless you have a low supply period, not, this isn't going to do anything. The yearly cycle full level that they're proposing, in my opinion, for what you talk about, aren't going to do a damn time for it. Even though they're going to keep it a little bit higher in the wintertime and reject kill as many muskrats, we are not going to alter. I don't see us altering. The seasonal component is very, very important. It's as important as the summer time thing for the reasons the Congress that was explaining earlier. Um, but uh, if the supplies were high, even all, during all the time periods I showed in the past when the supplies were high, the amount of metal marsh was small. But it always went down again and came back again. So what's happened now, we've gone 50 years without having a low. We need to have a low. We need to have a low. Frank, we've got to get this thing in steps and cancel. We still stay in a low supply period. We can get a couple of years of lows. And then we can wait 20 years for them. <laughs> Just a, just a short moment. I think it's an important point that uh, Doug has talked about the educational component of all of this, and particularly when you talk about riparian short property owners, it becomes immensely important. And that's the poor understanding of the principles of erosion. A lot of the riparian shore owners feel that if IJC would give them the water level that they want, there'll be no more erosion. <coughs> Well, erosion is a constant process. It takes place whether you have revetments, whether you have break walls, or whatever you do to armor the shoreline. Because a lot of the erosion that takes place takes place beginning offshore. As the toe of the bank begins to erode, eventually the break wall is going to fall in. And until I think we can get a better understanding of what erosion really is, we'll have a difficulty in gaining support and pointing out to riparians that uh, the answer isn't a good environmental plan. Or the, the, the answer lies in not what you have now in a stable water plan. The answer lies in a good environmental plan that uh, restores the natural processes again. And you recognize it, that if you want to live there, you're going to have to, to move back, or you're going to have to do certain things that are in keeping with the erosion process. But until the erosion process is understood, there will always be objection by uh, riparian owners. And I wish that we could find some way of uh, educating uh, uh, shoreline property owners to what erosion really is all about, what causes it, and it's going to happen regardless of what the lake level is. Well, thank you so much.